Rhetoric. Use, sometimes exaggerated, of language. At a time that requires tangible proposals, all he offers is unconscionable rhetoric. Clique. Small, exclusive group of people. It is not long before a young star has a clique around him, who sporadically get their names into the newspapers. Extol. Praise highly. Youngsters scoff when their elders extol the halcyon days of long ago. Mentor. Counselor, coach, tutor. Amidst the adulation of the throng, the film star, in all humility, credited her mentor as the one most responsible. Facile. Easily accomplished or attained. The detective interrogated the adamant prisoner in such a facile way that he confessed after giving incontrovertible evidence. To live in a fool's paradise. To be happy without a real basis. He lived in a fool's paradise while he sowed wild oats, but he soon had to pay the piper. A political show. The 2012 elections offered another example of politics as show business. Most politicians have prepared speeches dealing with the prevalent topics of the day. They can maintain a fervid flow of rhetoric for hours at a time. In each locality where he is to appear, the advance work is prepared by a clique of trustworthy aides. In preparation for the show, they have dispersed leaflets put up posters, and sent out cars and trucks with loudspeakers to extol the erudite qualities of their candidate. Soon, the crowd gathers. Loyal party workers come forward to shake the hand of their mentor. Now, with the facile solutions to complex problems carefully memorized, the show is ready to begin. One moment facetious, the next moment profound, the candidate works to convince the incredulous among the voters. Week 40, Day 2 Can't Insincere or almost meaningless talk The diplomat was astute enough to see through the cant of the Machiavellian ambassador. Umbridge Resentment, offense I was flabbergasted when he took umbrage at my whimsical remarks. Magnanimous. Generous, noble. A somber examination of those indigent families, bereft of hope, sunken in apathy, should motivate us to be more magnanimous in our attempts to improve their lot. Vilify. Malign, slander. We feel so sanctimonious when we vilify the character of a felon. Elucidate. To make clear. The judge ordered the censor to elucidate his reasons for removing passages from the book in such a capricious manner. The sum and substance. The heart or substantial part. The sum and substance of our Pyrrhic victory was that our hopes for a stable future had gone up in smoke. Getting a good look. The television press interview is conducive to close scrutiny of a candidate. His public speeches may contain many cant phrases, but a sharp question by an astute reporter can destroy a cliché filled statement. The politician now will procrastinate in his answer, a new facet of his personality may be revealed by his demeanor. Perhaps he will take umbrage at a suggestion that he favors the affluent. His record is searched for evidence that he has been equally magnanimous to the indigent. He accuses the reporter of attempting to vilify him. Is he being accused of turpitude in office? It is time to discreetly go on to another topic. 
The candidate wishes to extol the virtues of his program and record. The press wants to allude to things that keep him in the midst of controversy. They insist that he elucidate positions that the politician would rather leave in a nebulous state. Week 40, Day 3 Vapid Uninteresting, dull As a concomitant to his belligerent and vituperative antipathy toward his government, he became an expatriate, but he found it a vapid life. Unwieldy Bulky, difficult to handle Cairo was so disgruntled about having to move the unwieldy piano, she procrastinated for days. Proximity Nearness As the scion of an affluent family, he was often in proximity to opulence. Lassitude Weariness, weakness after playing with his progeny in the enervating sun, he staggered back to his room, where he was overcome with lassitude. Vitiate. Destroy the use or value. The irrelevant evidence seemed to vitiate the prosecutor's case and precluded a conviction. On pins and needles. To be on edge, jumpy. He was on pins and needles, while he cooled his heels in the principal's office. Seeing is learning. While we are all cognizant of the importance of words, to create certain impressions, gesture is relegated to a much lesser role. Gestures are an important concomitant, to even the most vapid speech, enhancing it and giving the hearer something, to look at while he listens. The value of seeing at the same time as listening was shown when a class at a university, unwieldy because of its large size, was split up. One group was put into a room in proximity to good loudspeakers. Every nuance of the lecturer's voice could be heard clearly. Because they had no person on whom to place their attention, they soon took on the appearance of extreme lassitude, most students became lethargic and rested their heads on their desks. The separation of visual and oral communication tended to vitiate the learning process. The listening group received grades lower than those received by those who could look at as well as hear the instructor. Week 40, Day 4 Augment Enlarge, increase the parsimonious octogenarian sought to augment his wealth by removing it from its cash and placing it in a bank. Fatuous Foolish, silly, inane The new employee wanted to gain favor with his boss, and his obsequious desires led to the most fatuous behavior. Contort Twist violently the paroxysm of coughing served to contort her body until she could gain a respite. Repertoire Works that an artist is ready to perform. Her virtuosity was demonstrated by the works she performed from her repertoire. Imperceptible Extremely slight or gradual. He had always appeared virile, so that the imperceptible decline toward senility went unnoticed, until he succumbed and began to use a cane. To have at one's fingertips. To have thorough knowledge, to have ready. He had at his fingertips an extensive repertoire. The Hammy Old Days Actors depend upon their ability to gesticulate almost as much as upon speech to obtain their desired histrionic effects. With them, gesture serves much more than merely to augment speech. When their communication is by gesture alone, it is called pantomime. 
In the early silent motion picture period, gestures were flamboyant. To show that he was distraught about the danger, in which the heroine had been placed, the hero would go through the most fatuous actions. He would stagger, beat his breast, tear his hair, and contort his face into the most doleful appearance. There weren't many simple or restrained gestures in his repertoire. The heroine, to indicate her love, would fling her arms wide and ardently jump into her sweetheart's arms. It was only much later that, actors became skilled enough to communicate with the audience, through discreet gestures and almost imperceptible changes, in facial expression that could transmit nuances of emotion. Week 41, Day 1 Curry To seek favor by flattery He discreetly tried to curry favor with his employer. Paul Cease to please, become dull. Those conditions were not conducive to a felicitous evening, as the dance would soon pall for the lack of feminine companionship. Succulent. Juicy. The connoisseur of fine foods declared the restaurant the ultimate in the preparation of succulent meat dishes. Satiety. Excess, overly full, surfeit. The host exhorted his guests to eat to satiety. Intrinsic. Within itself, inherent. She coveted the antiquated locket even though it had only an intrinsic value. A pretty kettle of fish. A mess, troubles. He thought it was an innocent white lie, but it got him into a pretty kettle of fish. Queen of the Supermarket The American housewife is queen of all she surveys in the supermarket. She decides what items shall be purchased. Grocery manufacturers are well aware of her power to make one product a success and another a failure. They spend huge sums developing new products with which to curry her favor. Fearful that a successful product will soon begin to pall, the manufacturers, without cessation, come out with new and improved versions to whet her appetite. Sometimes it is only a box or package that has been changed, perhaps a colorful photo of a succulent meal on a TV dinner box. In the larger supermarkets, the housewife is faced with a satiety of merchandise, particularly in the copiously stocked laundry detergent section. While there may be almost no intrinsic difference among the many brands, advertising and packaging serves to importune her to buy one rather than another. Week 41 Day 2 Potpourri Medley, Mixture A potpourri of today's musical hits sounds more like cacophony than harmony. Sanction Endorse, Certify I cannot sanction your lax attitude towards the imminent threat of a conflagration. Denote Indicate, show, mean. His levity at such a serious moment denotes a lack of feeling. Allude. Hint, suggest. You can be sure the candidate will allude to the moribund state of our economy and offer his panacea. Insidious. Sly, seductive, treacherous. In some insidious way, the glib salesman played upon my repressed desires and sold me a gaudy sports car. The acid test. A severe test. The new job was an acid test of his ability to bring home the bacon. It's what's outside that counts. Packaging of grocery items is a facet of advertising that is too little appreciated by consumers. Walking up and down the aisles of a supermarket, 
one seldom stops to analyze the individual package in the potpourri of items on the shelves. The manufacturer had to glean and test many different designs before he accepted the one you see in the array before you. Before he will sanction the use of a particular can, box, or bottle, he must know many things about its efficacy. He wants to know if the colors attract, a white box may denote cleanliness, a red one, strength. There may be a photo or a drawing that will allude to the product's use or special qualities. A lackluster package may be fatal. Next, the size and shape are important elements. The housewife may want a small package for easy storing, but a larger package may suggest economy. A round bottle may look attractive, but a square one is easier to stack. These are some of the insidious aspects of packaging, the main purpose of which is to attract your attention as you peruse the crowded supermarket shelves. Week 41, Day 3 Propriety Suitability, Correctness We question the propriety of making fun of obese people. Advent The coming of an important event With the advent of text messaging, Roger was busy night and day. Impious Lacking respect, irreverent in the milieu of city street life, it is not atypical to hear impious comments about authority. Proffer Offer for acceptance I'd like to proffer my belated congratulations on your 25 years of married serenity. Spate Rush, Flood a few years ago, there was a spate of science fiction films about awesome monsters, causing pandemonium on our planet, but after a surfeit of that genre, their popularity began to wane. A blind alley. A direction that leads nowhere. The modus operandi was leading up a blind alley and they were barking up the wrong tree. Tried and true. Few questioned the propriety of the current haste on the part of manufacturers to bring out new and improved products at the prevalent rate. At one time, in the dim, distant past before the advent of television, it was the vogue for products to be advertised on the merits of their tried and true qualities. Few advertisers were impious enough to jettison any part of a product that had been accepted by the public. Year after year, the local grocery store owner would proffer the same box of cereal, the same house cleaner. The acceptance was of the time-tested product, and it appeared almost unconscionable for the manufacturer to change his merchandise. Today's spate of transient products would have been considered an anomaly in those days. Week 41, Day 4 Shibboleth Pet phrase, slogan. People often try to compensate for their deplorable lack of culture by repeating the shibboleth, I know what I like. Bogus. Counterfeit, fake. He had the audacity to try to foist a bogus dollar on me. Substantiate. Confirm, ratify. The reporter wanted to elicit the pertinent facts from the reticent witness so he could substantiate the charge of moral turpitude against the high city official. Nutritive Having nourishing properties Mothers should be vigilant that their children's food has the proper nutritive value. Raucous Harsh, shrill there were raucous complaints about the inordinate number of fatal accidents caused by inebriated drivers. To twist around one's finger. To control completely. He winked at the little girl's bad behavior, she had him twisted around her finger.
What's in a name? Supermarkets now carry their own products to compete with the national brands. These house brands are not in a felicitous position because they cannot be advertised widely. Supermarkets overcome this encumbrance by making these brands less expensive. Many people believe the shibboleth, you get what you pay for, and they purchase items on the premise that quality varies as the price does. Are the claims made by nationally advertised brands bogus? How can one bread company substantiate its nutritive superiority over another? As there is no incontrovertible evidence, the more expensive bread, or coffee, etc., must compensate by increased advertising. They make inordinate claims, using those raucous techniques proven so successful in convincing the frugal consumer to switch to a more costly brand. Week 42, Day 1 Quandary Doubt, Dilemma He was in a quandary about which selection from his extensive repertoire it would be feasible to perform for the children. Callous Hardened, Unfeeling who can be callous about the presence of many indigent families in proximity to affluence? Expedient Advisable, fit Because she had committed only a venial offense, he thought it expedient to abjure a severe punishment. Negligible Trifling, inconsiderable it was fortuitous that the accident occurred when there were negligible numbers of children in the buses. Blasé Indifferent, not responsive to excitement. People have become so blasé about the once thrilling, now mundane flights into space. To do one's heart good. To make one feel happy or better. It did my heart good to see that inveterate egotist eat humble pie. You can't help but watch. The consumer is in a quandary about making a felicitous selection among the array of products. The advertisers must influence the malleable consumer, and often they do it in the most callous ways. Television offers many tangible advantages for reaching the consumer. As a result, the consumer is inundated by commercials. The advertiser knows that a television commercial is the most expedient way to reach large numbers of people. The cost for each commercial film is prodigious, but because the audience is so large, the cost per viewer is negligible. Each commercial is prepared in the most meticulous way in order to catch the attention of even the most blasé viewer and hold it until the message is through. Week 42, Day 2 Ennui Boredom The fledgling pianist knew that his mentor would take umbrage at his yawning during the lesson, but the feeling of ennui was overwhelming. Comely Beautiful, handsome He was reticent about revealing his clandestine meetings, with a comely young girl counselor at this camp. Frenetic Frantic, frenzied They were vigilant in order that their surreptitious meetings would not be discovered, and it often required frenetic changes of plans to preclude exposure. Artifice Strategy, trickery they furtively employed every kind of artifice to be able to meet. Diversity Variety, change The omnipotent dictator employed all of his rhetoric to vilify those who would be brash enough to suggest that a diversity of opinions should be expressed. Worth one's weight in gold Extremely valuable, very useful. 
The coach said the new star center was worth his weight in gold. Tricks of the trade Some television commercials, trying to break through the ennui built up in the viewer, by the plethora of competition, employ humor. Others feature a comely girl as a pretext for getting the viewer to stay tuned in. At times raucous music, accompanied by some frenetic activities, is designed to preclude the viewer's loss of attention. The advertiser will employ every bit of artifice at the filmmaker's command to make a trenchant commercial. The diversity of appeals made to the viewer is a concomitant of the many ways people react to commercials. A great deal of time and money has gone into placing the consumer's psychological makeup under scrutiny. Week 42, Day 3 Qualm Twinge of Conscience He had a serious qualm about hunting for the nearly extinct quarry. Expurgate Remove objectionable parts or passages. At times, the producer must expurgate some of the things said by these children because they are too candid. Begrudge. To be resentful or reluctant. She did not begrudge paying the pittance extra for a better coat. Artless. Innocent, naive. A successful television program can be built around the artless comments of very young children. Gratuity. Tip. He took umbrage when I offered a gratuity to augment his small salary. To make the best of a bad bargain. To change or go along with a poor situation. After he bought the white elephant, he made the best of a bad bargain and let sleeping dogs lie. Going to the source. The wide diversity of reasons people have for buying one product, rather than another, are investigated by the advertising people, in order to prepare efficacious commercials. They do not have the slightest qualm about questioning the consumer about personal things in her own domicile. The consumer is requested not to expurgate her answers. Generally, people are not reticent and do not begrudge giving the time and effort. The questions delve rather deeply, and what the artless responses divulge will help the advertiser decide what to put into his next commercial. After a large number of interviews, the copious results make it feasible to prognosticate how well the commercial will do. The interviewer usually offers no gratuity to the person who has helped, but often a sample of the product is proffered as thanks. Week 42, Day 4 Manifest Evident, Obvious It was manifest that an arbiter would be needed, because neither side would capitulate to a plan, foisted on them by the other side. Delve. Dig, do research. If we delve below and behind the rhetoric and invective, we may discover the profound reasons for the ferment in our land. Capricious. Fanciful, whimsical. When the acrimonious discussion about his capricious actions had attenuated, he was able to vindicate his conduct. Requisite. Requirement. One mortifying requisite for the position was that, he would have to work for one year, under the aegis of a fatuous egotist. Replenish. To fill again, to restock. He was reticent about emulating those who, after eating almost to satiety, rushed to replenish the food on their plates. To make ends meet. To manage on a given income. He turned thumbs down on a new car, he was having enough trouble making ends meet, as it was. 
It seems to work. Despite the antipathy toward commercials expressed by the viewers, the remarkable success of television commercials in selling products makes it manifest that the advertiser has gleaned what the viewer wants to see and hear from his research interview. This has helped the advertiser delve deeply into what motivates people when they go into the supermarket to purchase products. The advertising agency is never capricious and can vindicate spending large sums of money on research. Having uncovered what the public wants, the advertiser expedites putting the requisite words, music, and photographs of the product on film. He will thus replenish the never-ending, ubiquitous television commercial supply in the hope that the consumer will remember some facet of the film and buy the product. Week 43, Day 1 Roster A list of names The coach knew he would have to add experienced players to the roster to compensate for the spate of freshmen on the team. Stunted Checked in natural growth, held back in growth. There seems to be voluminous evidence that the mother's smoking will stunt the baby's growth. Atrophy Waste away The prodigy allowed his musical talent to atrophy as he redirected his career. Maim Disable, cripple When it seemed that Reggie would maim his opponent, we broke up the fight. Ameliorate. Improve, relieve. If you heap opprobrium on an impious child, it probably will not ameliorate the conditions that led to the rebelliousness. To burn the midnight oil. To study or work until very late. The radio was such an enigma that he had to burn the midnight oil for several nights in order to get it working. It takes more than medicine. If one were to look at the roster of physical handicaps, one would reach the somber conclusion that the list is a long one. Included would be stunted development of an arm or leg due to a birth anomaly. Others would be the result of a crippling disease that has caused muscles to atrophy. The list would go on with illnesses and injuries that maim and debilitate. Modern medicine has done much to ameliorate the physical problems. However, there are an inordinate number of problems, of the handicap that have still to be alleviated. People are not naturally callous, but in some perverse way they have the propensity, to repress any concern with the physically handicapped. The social problems seem to be inherent in our own attitudes. Week 43, Day 2 Cynic Pessimist, skeptic. It is easy to become a cynic when the same adults who inveigh most vehemently against the uncouth actions that they say permeate our youth drink to satiety and behave fatuously. Unctuous. Affectedly emotional. We had to wince as we watched the newcomer try to wheedle and ingratiate himself into the teacher's favor in the most unctuous manner. Benevolent. Kindly, charitable. We all have moments when we vacillate between selfish and benevolent desires. Subservient. Servile, obsequious. While his demeanor remained imperturbable, there was latent anger at the ignominious and subservient role he had to play. Iniquity Injustice, wickedness Those who are complacent about any iniquity in our society should be wary of the unsavory consequences for all. To lay one's cards on the table To talk frankly 
He knew he was out of his depth so he laid his cards on the table and asked for assistance. Doing the right thing The obstacles that frustrate the physically handicapped person who is seeking employment may turn him into a cynic. Too often a prospective employer, with a rather unctuous manner, actually tends to degrade the handicapped by proffering employment that is really beneath them and their abilities. The employer appears to be acting in a benevolent manner, but this attitude shows no compassion, for he really expects the person seeking the job to remain subservient. This iniquity cannot but give the handicapped a feeling that they are being discriminated against. He does not expect a sinecure, but he has an aversion to the prevalent belief that he should consider himself lucky to find any employment. Week 43, Day 3 Largest Gift, Gratuity, Liberality He felt it would be ignominious for him to accept any largess from the charlatan whose Machiavellian schemes had made him affluent. Criterion Model, Standard, Test The platitude, I know what I like, is often used to rationalize our lack of a criterion for things about which we are dubious. Repent. Regret, desire to make amends. After every election we repent, in a belated criticism, the apathy and complacency of so many people who failed to vote. Mollify. Pacify, appease. When mother is in a peak about some infraction of a rule, it takes all of our dexterity to mollify her. Mercenary. Motivated by desire for gain, greedy. Behind the facade of ostensible benevolence there was a mercenary streak. A bolt from the blue. A great surprise. The windfall from his distant cousin came like a bolt from the blue. A better way. Why is there any question about the propriety of hiring the physically handicapped? No one who understands their needs can condone this attitude. The offering of employment should not be considered a largess. There should be no need to vindicate the hiring of a handicapped person. The only criterion should be what he is capable of doing. If this is the approach, the handicapped worker will not feel he is an encumbrance to his boss. The employer, on the other hand, will find it conducive to good work and will not repent his having tried something new just to mollify his conscience. Even for the most mercenary employer, there should be no reticence in eliciting the best that is possible from the handicapped worker. Week 43, Day 4 Pariah Social Outcast he was stigmatized as a pariah when he had the audacity to boast of his nefarious and sordid career printing bogus money. Aloof. Distant, apart, reserved. Although many people say this is a propitious time to invest in the stock market, there is a tenable argument for remaining aloof. Pragmatic. Practical, based on experience. You can't argue with success, was his pragmatic reply to derogatory remarks about a movie star who had only superficial talent as an actor. Vestige. Trace, evidence. After therapy, there remained hardly a vestige of his phobia. Guys. Manner, appearance, mean. In the guise of maintaining national unity under military rule, there was a paucity of even innocuous dissent. To tell tales out of school. To reveal harmful secrets. 
The fat was in the fire for the politician, when his private secretary started telling tales out of school, about his secret sources of income. Just be yourself. Socially, the handicapped person is often treated as a pariah. Most people hold themselves aloof from normal contact with those who are different. This social separation propagates additional feelings of antipathy. If normal individuals would socialize with the handicapped individual, they would learn in a pragmatic way that these are people who happen to have a physical handicap. The handicap does not make them any less human. The iniquity of assuming that physical superiority equals moral superiority prevents all of us from direct human relationships. As long as there is a vestige of feeling that handicapped people are inferior, then we are all handicapped in one way or another. Under the guise of physical superiority, we demonstrate a moral turpitude that is harmful to all. Week 44, Day 1 Nullify Abolish, Cancel In order to nullify the height advantage of his adversary, he abjured smoking and did an inordinate amount of exercise, until he was the acme of lightness and dexterity. Deluge To Flood the office was deluged with requests for his autograph, as the girls became cognizant of his identity. Futility Uselessness In spite of his efforts to cajole the girl, she remained aloof, and the futility of his efforts made him lugubrious. Carnage Slaughter we found it impossible to mollify the irate owner of three prize cats as he viewed the carnage caused by our large dog. Technology Applied Science To our consternation, modern technology has made feasible a spate of lethal devices that could lead to the inadvertent destruction of the world. To build upon sand. To have a poor base, or not sufficient preparation. Because they were amateurs and without money, the political campaign was built upon sand, and the candidate was a flash in the pan. Have we mastered our environment? Natural disasters tend to nullify the best efforts of mankind. It is as though there are forces at work that are contemptuous of our proud achievements. Who has not read of or seen the waters that deluge our towns and cities, jeopardizing lives and culminating in the destruction of the results of endless work, in the space of a few moments? We are all vulnerable to feelings of futility as we view the carnage, caused to cattle from the sudden inundation. Despite the laudable advances made in technology, it can be seen that we cannot yet say we have mastered our environment. Disasters of this type, leaving only pathetic vestiges of homes and shops, are accepted as inevitable, and all we can do is to attempt to ameliorate the conditions that result. Week 44, Day 2 Libel Degradation by writing or publishing Publishers of newspapers and magazines augment their staff with lawyers to represent them when they are sued for libel. Defamatory Damaging character by false reports I resent your defamatory remark that depicts me as a culprit. Plaintiff the complaining party, in law. The egregious calumny of the defendant worked to the advantage of the plaintiff. Canard. A made-up sensational story. The mayor vehemently denied there was any antipathy between the governor and himself and blamed this canard on their political opponents. Deprecate. 
Express disapproval. The cynic will deprecate the motives of anyone who tries to ameliorate the iniquities in our society. A pretty kettle of fish. A messy situation, a problem. He knew that when he attacked the sacred cow, he would be in a pretty kettle of fish. Good news and bad. One of the latent dangers indigenous to our constitutional guarantee of freedom of the press has to do with the protection of the individual against the detriment that might come from news reports involving him. There are libel laws that protect against false charges. If an individual believes his character or livelihood have been damaged by a defamatory article, he can sue. As the plaintiff he must refute the story and show how the defendant caused him harm by printing a canard. The defendant attempts to substantiate the truth of the article. The printing of news may besmirch an individual's character, but there is no way to alleviate this problem without changes in the Constitution. This would be tantamount to destroying the efficacy of our coveted right to learn the truth from the press. We all deprecate a situation in which someone suffers because of exposure in the newspapers. Only when the harm is caused by someone with a desire to malign under the guise of printing the news can the individual expect to win compensation through the courts. Week 44, Day 3 Reputed Thought, supposed, believed The drug is reputed to have a salubrious effect on nascent conditions of this type. Frail Delicate, weak His awesome mental dexterity compensated for his frail physical condition. Potent Powerful, strong, intense When Ben's muscles began to atrophy, the doctor initiated therapy with a potent new drug. Excoriate Criticize severely. Even though she was piqued at his indolent manner, it was pathetic to listen to her excoriate him in public. Devout. Religious, sincere. Although he was a devout adherent of the party, he remained aloof during the vitriolic primary campaign. To toe the mark. To obey or stick to a rule or policy. He wanted to kick over the traces, but his parents made him toe the mark. A Philosopher for Our Time Soren Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher who is reputed to be the forerunner of the current vogue of existentialism. In appearance he was a frail and ungainly man. An extremely erudite thinker and writer, he was a potent force in propagating the new approach to life. His philosophy would excoriate those who believe that man could stand aside from life. In his philosophy it is a heresy to take a detached point of view, it is incumbent upon the individual to get involved. What is germane is not that we exist, but that our existence is determined by our acts. He was a religiously devout man who fervently believed that the individual is always paramount. Week 44, Day 4 Diminutive Tiny, small Europeans drive diminutive cars because their narrow roads and high prices for gasoline are not conducive to or compatible with our large ones. Profuse Overflowing, abundant the connoisseur was able to glean a worthwhile painting from the profuse variety of poor ones at the exhibit. Dulcet Sweet or melodious to the ear The boisé devotee of the opera was awakened from his ennui by the dulcet tones of the new soprano. Impromptu Spur of the moment Offhand. 
As the music reached a frenetic tempo, the audience lost all decorum and broke into impromptu dancing. Malevolent. Ill-disposed, ill-intentioned. He had no qualms about opposing the clique, who insidiously exerted a malevolent influence on the president. To be under a cloud. To be in temporary disgrace or trouble. Until they discovered the real thief, he was under a cloud. The Island of Wild Dogs The saga of the introduction of that diminutive songbird, the canary, into the homes of the world as tame pats is an interesting one. In the 16th century a trading ship going to Italy stopped at an island named Canis, from the Latin word for wild dog, which could be found there in profuse numbers, off the coast of Africa. The dulcet song of the wild birds whetted the interest of the captain. In impromptu cages hundreds were taken aboard to be traded. The sailors called these gray-green birds, spotted with yellow, canaries. As they approached the island of Elba, near Italy, a malevolent storm put the boat in jeopardy of sinking. A member of the crew released the birds, and the intrepid canaries instinctively flew towards land. The peasants on Elba took the wild canaries in as pets. Eventually, the birds found their way into homes throughout Europe, where they were domesticated and bred for a variety of song and shades of colors. The canaries prevalent today differ greatly from the ones discovered over 400 years ago. Week 45, Day 1 Wistful Longing, pensive, wishful to be candid, there is little to be wistful about in the good old days. Raiment Dress, clothing The potpourri of Ocurant fashionable raiment includes the fatuous and the discreet. Brigand Robber, bandit They captured the brigand, and he was incarcerated for a mandatory period. Corpulent. Fleshy, obese, excessively fat. Is there any veracity in the platitude that corpulent men are jocose? Rail. Scold, use abusive language. While all disgruntled men may rail against malevolent or Machiavellian leaders, democracy offers a way to ameliorate iniquities through the ballot. To flog a dead horse. To continue to make an issue of something that is over. He thought he could keep the pot boiling about his opponents winking at crime, but he was flogging a dead horse. In days of yore. Current novels are replete with lurid crimes, carnage and death. Do you get wistful when you recall the romantic tales that begin with, an innocent maiden traveling through the rustic countryside? She is dressed in glittering raiment. The scene is idyllic. Without warning, the group is set upon by a virile brigand, who, in the most perfunctory and callous fashion, carries her off. Pandemonium results. Her entourage is in a state of bedlam. Her corpulent escort is irate, but unable to do anything to thwart this debacle. All he can do is rail against the catastrophe. What to do? What to do? Week 45, Day 2 Raconteur A skilled storyteller Well known as a raconteur, he was never chagrined when asked to tell a story from his large repertoire. Sullen. Ill-humored, grim. Despite all attempts to mollify her, she remains sullen about the levity caused by her slovenly raiment. Rift. A split, an opening. 
He alluded to the rift caused in the school by the plethora of hirsute boys, who ignored the criterion for appearance. Emissary An agent The obscure country, an aspirant for membership in the United Nations, sent an emissary. Ruminate Ponder, reflect upon an anomaly of our modern technology is that the more we need to know, the less time we have to ruminate. The die is cast. An unchangeable decision has been made. The fat was in the fire and the die was cast when he decided to tell the white lie about how he had found the money. Woe is me. The raconteur of our story about idyllic times, gone by goes on to elucidate how the comely heroine is taken to the bandit's hideout. There, a sullen crew of cutthroats is gathered. They don't wish to procrastinate, she must be taken immediately to a foreign land, where much treasure will be paid for her. Their cupidity knows no bounds. The leader wants to hold her for ransom from her wealthy parents. The gang demurs, they are reticent. There is a rift among the criminals. Their leader remains truculent, and they agree to wait for just two days for the ransom money. An emissary from the grief-stricken parents is expected at any moment. The wan maiden, her spirits at their nadir, has time to ruminate about her lugubrious fate. Week 45, Day 3 Taught Tense, keyed up, on edge. There was a taut international situation, caused by the proximity of unidentified submarines to our coasts. Livid. Pale. The rabid baseball fan lost his equanimity and became livid, when the star pitcher became pugnacious and was removed from the game. Martinet. Strict disciplinarian. When one enlists in the army, one expects to be under the aegis of a martinet. Yen. Strong desire, strong longing. His yen for imbibing and romping with girls worked to his detriment. Bagatelle. A trifle. The little boy tried to wheedle a larger allowance from his father, by the caustic observations, that it was a mere bagatelle, when compared to the allowances of his friends. A cat's paw. A person used as a tool or dupe. The spy used the innocent girl as a cat's paw, to get military information from the grapevine. To the rescue. Back at the castle, the situation is taught with emotion. The fair maiden's mother is livid with fear and anxiety, she has attacks of vertigo. She talks about her daughter's audacity in riding out into the ominous forests, despite many similar kidnappings. The girl's father, a martinet who rules his family with an iron hand, staunchly refuses to pay the ransom. Iniquity shall not be rewarded. At this moment of crisis a heroic knight volunteers to rescue our heroine, he has had a secret yen for the young beauty. Avoiding rhetoric, he pledges his all to castigate those responsible for this ignominious deed. He holds his life as a mere bagatelle, against the duty he owes his beloved mistress. At the propitious moment, he rides off to do or die for her. Week 45, Day 4 Callow. Youthful, inexperienced. It was deplorable the way the capricious girl led the callow youth on a merry chase. Appalled. Dismayed, shocked. Each long holiday weekend we are appalled at the carnage on our highways. Penchant. A strong leaning in favor. 
I do not wish to deprecate your penchant for cowboy music, but I find it banal. Decapitate. Behead. We do not decapitate criminals because of our aversion to such repugnant punishments. Termagant. A scolding woman, a shrew. Why do you remain docile while that termagant besmirches, maligns, and belittles you? Coup de gras. The finishing stroke. When my girlfriend left me, it was a bitter pill to swallow, but the coup de gras was that she kept my engagement ring. Well done, Sir Knight. Seeking his adversaries, the knight rides to their hideout. Despite his callow appearance, he is reputed to disdain danger and to be a prodigious horseman. The kidnappers lose their equanimity at his approach. They are appalled at the prospect, and they are in a quandary as to which one will meet him on the field of combat. The leader, under duress, rides out. Do you have a penchant to die? Derides the knight. More vituperative remarks follow. They spur their horses toward each other. It takes but one blow for our hero to decapitate the villain. The others flee to avoid their imminent destruction. The knight takes the maiden on his horse, and they ride back to the castle. Their wedding soon follows. Little does the knight realize that the fair maiden is a garrulous termagant who will make his life miserable with caustic remarks. Still, the cliché, and they lived happily ever after, must conclude our fabricated tale. Week 46, Day 1 Ascertain Discover, find out about in order to ascertain the relationship between his girlfriend and his brother, he kept a wary and discreet vigil. Dormant. Resting, asleep. He was appalled at the apathy concerning the important issue that had remained dormant for so long a time. Burgeoned. Flourished, grew. While some moribund economies atrophied after World War II, others burgeoned under the salubrious effects of loans from the U.S. Potentate Ruler The callous potentate kept an imperturbable mien when requested to alleviate the unconscionable conditions existing in his land. Disseminate Spread, scatter. We are quick to disseminate calumny, but reticent about things that may be construed as compliments. Straight from the shoulder. In a direct, open way. I took the wind out of his sails by telling him straight from the shoulder that I was not going to wink at his apple polishing. A mighty empire. One of the anomalies of our approach to history is the propensity to study the venerable empires of Europe, but we do not feel it incumbent upon us to ascertain anything about the civilizations in our own hemisphere. We deprecate the history of this part of the world as though progress lay dormant and that other peoples were irrelevant until the settlers of North America arrived at Plymouth Rock. In South America, from 2000 BC until their empire reached its acme, at the beginning of the 16th century, lived the Incas. The site of the capital city of the Inca Empire, Cusco, lay at a height of 11,000 feet. This civilization is reputed to have burgeoned, until it covered more than 2,500 miles of the western part of the continent. Its population fluctuated between 4 and 7 million. This empire had a highly efficacious political and social system. Its potentate ruled with absolute power. As the empire conquered new lands, it would disseminate its language, religion, and social customs. 
Week 46, Day 2 Derived Descended from, received from a source A pragmatic philosopher derived the theory that we have noses in order to hold up our eyeglasses. Prerogative An exclusive right or power He gave his adversary the dubious prerogative of choosing the weapon, by which he was to meet his inevitable end. Nepotism Favoritism toward relatives Your efforts to ingratiate yourself into your boss's favor are nullified by the unmitigated nepotism manifest in this firm. Dearth Scarcity, lack in the potpourri of restaurants there is no dearth of succulent dishes. Internecine Involving conflict within a group, mutually destructive. The emissary from the president tried to allay the fears that a deleterious internecine feud was inevitable within the party. To rub a person the wrong way to do something that irritates or annoys. The quickest way to rub a person the wrong way is to give him the cold shoulder. A battle for power. The Inca emperor derived his prodigious power and authority from the gods. The paramount god was the sun god. It was from him the ruler passed on his prerogative, to rule to his most astute son. This nepotism had worked with great efficacy for centuries. The land holdings were immense, there were rich farmlands and llamas and alpacas for wool. Precious metals were plentiful, silver, copper, bronze, and the most sacred of all, gold. This metal resembled the sun god whom they extolled. There was no dearth of idols and ornaments hammered from this gleaming metal. There was always more gold coming from the mines, to replenish the supply. At the acme of his power, the Inca ruler died without naming the requisite successor. In 1528 two sons began an internecine struggle for control. For the next four years the empire sank into the lassitude, caused by civil war. Week 46, Day 3 Tyro. Beginner, novice. Although he was erudite about a copious number of things, he was a naive, callow Tyro when it came to relating to girls. Sophistry. False reasoning or argument. Her sophistry made use of every glib artifice. Factitious. Sham, artificial. In the office he played the factitious role of a martinet, while at home he was filled with compassion. Encomium. High praise. The modest prodigy treated the fervid encomiums that followed his performance as though they were a mere bagatelle. Obloquy. Disgrace. Shame, dishonor. John Wilkes Booth's egregious act remains an infamous obloquy. To draw in one's horns. To become cautious. He knew he was out of his depth, so he drew in his horns and quit the poker game. A perfidious conqueror. The feuding between the rival sons reached its pinnacle in 1532, at that moment Francisco Pizarro came onto the scene. A native of Spain, he was sojourning in Panama, when he heard of the riches to be found in that far-off land. Overwhelmed with cupidity, but still a tyro when it came to wresting power and wealth, from hapless people, he joined with an inveterate adventurer. They gathered a small band of mercenaries. The first two attempts failed, and Pizarro returned to Spain, to request authority and money, in order to conquer the west coast of South America. 
whether by sophistry or cajolery, he was given the requisite aid. With a force of 180 men, the dregs of society, he invaded Inca territory. He reached the city where the current ruler, Atahualpa, was holding court. The Incas welcomed Pizarro who, in a factitious display of friendship, heaped encomiums upon Atahualpa. Unknown to the Incas, Pizarro had brought guns, that were still beyond the technology of these people. The obloquy of his next act, ambushing the Incas and taking Atahualpa prisoner, will live in the history books that are replete with tales of conquest. Week 46, Day 4 Hyperbole Exaggerated figure of speech The rhetoric soared into flagrant hyperbole. Munificent Generous He was surprised by the munificent gratuity, given by the usually parsimonious termagant. Prevarication Deviation from the truth, lying. Her constant prevarication made her a pariah to her friends. Charisma. Quality of leadership inspiring enthusiasm. Even those who were not fans of the movie star, candidly admit the charisma that surrounded him. Genocide. Planned destruction of an entire people. The United Nations has outlawed genocide as the ultimate crime, which must be eradicated. To throw cold water. To discourage a plan or idea. I was going to pull up stakes and move out lock, stock, and barrel, but my wife threw cold water on the whole thing. The End of an Empire The Machiavellian Pizarro held the captured Atahualpa for ransom. He was adamant about receiving a room filled with gold, to the height of a man's shoulder. This was taken as a hyperbole at first, but Pizarro knew the gullible Incas would be munificent, when it came to rescuing their sacred ruler. They did not procrastinate, and a frenetic collection of gold took place. Pizarro, to whom prevarication was natural in dealing with the Incas, had no qualms about executing their ruler, as soon as he had the gold. The Inca Empire was moribund, but the charisma that surrounded Atahualpa was such that, after his death, the Incas fought on tenaciously in his name for several years. Eventually, superior weapons quelled all opposition. A policy of genocide was adopted by the Spanish conquerors, and almost two million of these proud people died in the carnage that followed. The saga of an ancient civilization thus came to an end. Week 47, Day 1 Impregnable Incapable of being entered A company of marines was unable to penetrate the seemingly impregnable fortress. Toxic. Harmful. Coal miners are often subject to toxic fumes. Extenuating. Excusable. Robert's defense lawyer pointed out the extenuating conditions of the case. Neophyte. Beginner. Although Sarah was skillful at math, she was a neophyte at computers. Patriarch. Elder. Grandfather is the recognized patriarch of our family. A dry run. Trial, test, exercise. Before opening night, the actors had several dry runs. Titanic Mystery On April 14, 1912, an incident took place, that became a front-page story in newspapers all over the world. It is a tale, that has continued to capture the attention of movie and theater goers, of opera and television audiences, of novelists and playwrights. 
It's the story of the allegedly impregnable Titanic, the unsinkable majestic ocean liner, that tumbled to the bottom of the icy Atlantic waters, with 1,600 passengers still aboard. How could such a toxic tragedy have occurred? Could it have been avoided? How could the naval patriarch, Captain Edward Smith, no neophyte, he have allowed the disaster to happen? What were the extenuating circumstances that led to the death of that glorious White Star Queen? In September 1985, the hulk of the Titanic was found on the ocean's floor, providing many answers to the questions that seamen and landlubbers had wrestled with over the years. Week 47, Day 2 Forebodings Premonitions, Evil Omens Caesar's wife had foreboding about danger facing her husband. Emanating Coming from The rulings emanating from the local court were cheered by the conservatives. Miscreant One who behaves badly The class miscreant was made to remain after school. Protocol Forms of ceremony Failing to follow protocol got Sophia into trouble at the office. Circuitous Roundabout Cindy took a circuitous route home to avoid the class bullies. To throw someone a curve. To do the unexpected. When I least expected it, Helen threw me a curve. What went wrong? Investigators found that a series of mistakes led to the sinking of the Titanic. A wireless message had come in from a French liner, warning of ice ahead, but that was a thousand miles away, and so, no need to worry. On April 13, the vessel Raffinock also warned the Titanic of dangerous ice ahead. On the following day, there came a spate of other warnings from a Cunard ship, a Dutch liner, and the White Star Baltic, all telling of icebergs about 250 miles from the Titanic's current position. Next came the German America, echoing the same forebodings, followed by the California, cautioning the Titanic about the field ice. Finally, the Masaba called attention to an enormous belt of ice, stretching directly across the Titanic's path. All the messages emanating from sister ships should have had a profound effect on Smith and company. No one miscreant could be fingered, but a host of crew members were certainly blameworthy. Why didn't Captain Smith's officers react to those messages? Notations were indeed made on slips of paper, but largely ignored and forgotten. There was no standard protocol for the handling of such messages, if there had been, Captain Smith would certainly have taken a circuitous route, so as to avoid the dangerous icebergs. Week 47, Day 3 Knell. Sound of a bell. When the knell sounded, the students closed their books and their minds. Macabre. Gruesome. Some critics were unhappy about the bloody macabre scenes in the movie. Ramifications. Complications. Heidi was concerned about the ramifications of her employer's new policy. Rapacious Greedy, taking by force The rapacious dictator used mustard gas against his enemies. Insurgent Rebellious Additional troops were dispatched to deal with the insurgent threat. To cross the Rubicon. A limit that allows for no return. When I crossed the Rubicon by signing the contract, I knew I could never go back on my commitment. Death knell for the Titanic. And then it happened. 
White in its innocence, a monstrous iceberg smashed into the luxury liner, ripping an ugly gash of 250 feet along the starboard and causing a fatal wound. Within seconds, thousands of cubic feet of water had penetrated the shattered hull. One after another, domino-like, the watertight compartments and bulkhead were flooded. The unthinkable had happened, despite the absolute guarantees of the shipbuilders, Harland and Wolf. There followed a macabre scene as the ship's band, clad in their tuxedos, continued to play show tunes while hordes of terrified passengers, many in nightclothes, rushed toward the lifeboats. The crew called out, women and children first, but their lack of an orderly plan for loading would have profound ramifications. In fact, some boats that could hold 30 were sent into the Atlantic with only a handful of people, generally first-class passengers. As panic began to take hold, the realization that there weren't enough lifeboats exacerbated the situation, bringing out the worst in a rapacious few. Several insurgent males ignored the crew and jumped into descending lifeboats. It was an act of shame they would have to live with for the rest of their lives. Week 47, Day 4 Glut Oversupply Our choir has a glut of tenors and a shortage of sopranos. Risible Laughable What Harry felt was risible, Sally thought was pathetic. Dilatory Delaying Umpires do not like pitchers who use dilatory styles. Specious. Deceptively attractive. In debating, specious arguments are rarely effective. Denouement. Outcome. The play's denouement came with three dead bodies on the stage. To brave the elements. To go out in bad weather. Despite the freezing rain, Cynthia decided to brave the elements. The Lawyer's Turn As one might have expected, manifold lawsuits against the White Star Line began to crop up within weeks of the sinking and rescue. The glut of billionaires on board, Astors, Wideners, Guggenheims, Strausses, et al., did not file any claims, but other cases went all the way to the Supreme Court and kept lawyers and judges busy for the next four years. The average claim had been for a modest $1,500, and the average award, paid by the White Star Line, was a risible $1,000. White Star's top-notch legal staff was accused of using dilatory tactics, tiring the claimants until they agreed to settle for a mere pittance. Their lawyers called many claims specious and rejected them out of hand. The denouement of the story is rather sad. American and British maritime law had long given special protection to ship owners on the grounds that their business was such a risky one. And so there was a limit to the amount of money that White Star could be assessed. In the end, they paid only 4% of the $16 million, originally demanded by the survivors, and were happy to close the books on the ocean disaster. We can imagine that if a similar tragedy were to take place today, the settlements would be in the hundreds of millions. Week 48, Day 1 Dolorous Sad we were surprised when Ted's happy expression turned into a dolorous one. Enervated. Worn out. Enervated by his long walk, Jose took to his bed. Suffrage. Right to vote. The dictator lied when he claimed he favored suffrage for women. Cabal. Secret group of plotters. The members of the revolutionary cabal were arrested and jailed. Odious. 
Despicable. Sylvia's odious remarks caused the audience to turn against her. To kill the goose that laid the golden egg. To spoil a good deal. By being greedy, the accountant killed the goose that laid the golden egg. Good news and bad. On Palm Sunday, April 9, 1865, General Ulysses S. Grant sent a terse dispatch to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. It contained the long-awaited sentence that the Confederate General Robert E. Lee had surrendered. The dolorous civil war that had crippled the young nation was finally over. President Lincoln was only 56 at the time, but he looked 20 years older. The burden of being a wartime president had so enervated Lincoln that Surgeon General Barnes feared an imminent nervous breakdown. When Grant's news reached Lincoln, he went to the front windows of the White House and waved to the crowd below. He proceeded to make a brief speech about the problems of Reconstruction and advocated the granting of suffrage to Negro soldiers. Among the listeners was a Southern patriot, the popular actor John Wilkes Booth, almost as famous in the theater as his father, Junius. That's the last speech he will ever make, said Booth to a fellow member of his cabal of conspirators. Booth's odious plan was to assassinate Lincoln, whom he hated passionately, while an associate, George Atzerodt, would do the same to Vice President Andrew Johnson. Week 48, Day 2 Prescient Able to predict Claiming to be prescient, the fortune teller took advantage of the gullible woman. Verbatim Word for word With remarkable talent, the reporter was able to quote speeches verbatim. Reverie Dream In her reverie, Ellen saw herself as the next U.S. president. Thespian Actor Yearning to be a thespian, Roger took lessons from a dramatic coach. Despot Tyrant When he lost control of the militia, the despot was forced to flee. To carry coals to Newcastle A waste of time Telling the racing car driver how to drive is like carrying coals to Newcastle. The Dreams of Lincoln and Booth Lincoln's family and friends remembered that the president had a prescient dream in March, several weeks before the fatal day, and provided them with a verbatim account. He told of entering the East Room, in the White House, where a throng of people were gathered around an open coffin. In his reverie, Lincoln asked a soldier, who is dead in the White House? The president, was the reply. He was killed by an assassin. Mrs. Lincoln said, I'm glad I don't believe in dreams, or I should be in terror from this time forth. Lincoln's was the calming voice, let's try to forget it. I think the Lord in his own good time and way, will work this out all right. Of course, all who loved Abe Lincoln would have been deeply agitated, if they had known what John Wilkes Booth was planning. As a Southern secessionist, he despised the president. As a thespian, he romanticized the action that he could take to rid the nation of a cruel warmonger. Although he had not taken an active part in the Civil War, he was convinced that he could contribute to the Confederate cause by kidnapping the bearded despot. It wasn't exactly clear in his mind whether he would capture Lincoln and take him to Richmond, where he could be exchanged for Confederate prisoners of war, or whether he would just put a bullet in the president's head. Week 48, Day 3 Pathological Disordered in Behavior The defense lawyer admitted that his client was a pathological liar. Articulate. Well spoken. Hal was surprisingly articulate for a high school freshman. 
Grandeur. Magnificence. In history class, we studied the grandeur of Greece and the glory of Rome. Polemic. Controversial argument. The team captain's polemic led to a fist fight in the locker room. Impasse. Deadlock. The impasse was broken when the union agreed to management's offer. An axe to grind. To pursue a selfish aim. Senator Smith was in favor of the bill, but we knew that he had an axe to grind. The assassins make ready. The pathological yet articulate Booth had rounded up several co-conspirators and shared his delusions of grandeur with them. He had produced a polemic that convinced his crew that it would be a patriotic thing to capture the president. One of them was assigned to shut off the master gas valve at Ford's theater when Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln were seated there at the play. With all the lights out, Booth would bind and gag the president. Two men would lower Lincoln onto the stage and then carry him out the rear door to a covered wagon waiting in the alley. They would head for Port Tobacco and then ferry across the Potomac to their ultimate destination, Richmond, Virginia. Several dry runs had not worked out for the Cabalists, who were about to reach an impasse, when Booth learned that Lincoln would be celebrating General Grant's victories with a party at Ford's Theater on the night of April 14. He promised the small group that destiny was at hand, their bold act, he said, would make their names famous forever in the annals of U.S. history. In the late afternoon of April 14, Booth watched a rehearsal of the play that would be performed that evening. He had reviewed his action plan and the escape route, and he believed it to be foolproof. He mouthed the phrase he would use after killing Lincoln, six semper tyrannies, thus always to tyrants. The curtain was about to go up, on one of the darkest days in the country's history. Week 48, Day 4 Regimen A System of Control Aunt Ethel's morning regimen called for three cups of coffee. Denigrated Defamed when her boss denigrated Martha's stenographic ability, she quit. Guile Trickery Using guile, the magician pulled the wool over the spectator's eyes. Mortal Leading to death The blow to the boxer's jaw turned out to be a mortal one. Inflicted. Imposed upon. The prison guards inflicted torture on some of the inmates. To throw one's hat in the ring. To run for political office. Before a gathering of the party's faithful, the local congressman threw his hat in the ring for the position of senator. Now he belongs to the ages. At 8.25, the Lincolns arrived at the theater. When they entered booths 7 and 8, as regimen dictated, the band played Hail to the Chief. The 1675 members of the audience stood to honor the great man, and then the play commenced. It is reported that Booth said to a drunk, who had denigrated his acting skill, when I leave the stage, I will be the most famous man in America. At about 10 p.m., with extreme guile, Booth had managed to be behind box 7 in the darkness of the hallway. He saw the silhouette of a head above the horsehair rocker. Derringer in his hand, he aimed it between the president's left ear and his spine. The shot was drowned out by laughter on the stage. Shouting revenge for the South, Booth climbed over the ledge of the box and jumped onto the stage, breaking his leg in the process. In pain, Booth limped out the stage door, where his horse was waiting and made his getaway. Days later, however, he was cornered in a Virginia barn and shot. Three of the cabal members were arrested and hanged. 
At the theater, a 23-year-old doctor attended to the wounded president. He found that the lead shot had lodged in Lincoln's brain, a bad sign. Several soldiers carried Mr. Lincoln across the street to a private house. His family physician came and so did the Surgeon General. The president struggled throughout the long night, but it was apparent that a mortal wound had been inflicted, and he could not be saved. At 7.22 a.m., it was over, two silver coins were placed on the assassinated president's eyes. Then Secretary Stanton uttered the famous words, now he belongs to the ages. Thank you.